Um, my name's uh, Greg Bright, and before I introduce our panellists, um, I just want to raise a few questions um, just to think about, not necessarily to answer, although the panellists will, will uh, answer one or, or, uh, or two of them. If you ask any super fund chief executive or uh, chairman of the board almost uh, uh, as well, um, whether or not they, uh, they run their fund as, as, it's, uh, as if it's a business, they will invariably answer uh, absolutely. Should they be though? Should a super fund uh, actually be run as a business? If it is run as a business, is it a big business or is it a small business? Under the normal definitions of uh, the small business agency, for instance, the old one in, in New South Wales, um, a small business is defined as uh, one which has fewer than 100 employees. So even a, a fund like Australian Super would, under that definition, be considered a small business. Clearly, they have uh, all funds have uh, um, large uh, assets uh, to deploy, and, and any other uh, any other definition would have to be considered a very large business. Many are still virtual businesses, um, uh, particularly the the old corporate uh, super funds um, with uh, their f primary function being to manage outsource partners. What does that mean for, for the culture and the sustainability of a fund if it is a, a virtual business? <laughs> when you look at super funds, the history, um, and you think about, uh, say, the next 20 years, will they fall into the trap of the old mutual life officers and uh, primarily exist for the management and, uh, and the board rather than the members. And what happens when the next generation of management and trustees take over? Will they have still the fire in the belly? Will they maintain the rage uh, which has uh, brought not only industry funds but also uh, government and large corporate funds to where they are today? Um, we're very lucky to have uh, three esteemed chief executives who need no introduction, so I'm not going to give them much of an introduction. Um, Anne-Marie Corboy is the chief executive of, of HESTA. She will speak uh, first for a few minutes. And she'll be followed by David Elia, the chief executive of Host Plus, who will do the same, and then David Atkin, uh, the uh, um, recent recruit as uh, chief executive of, of CBUS. So please welcome to the podium, first of all, Anne-Marie Corboy. Thanks, Greg, and it's uh, a pleasure to be able to um, speak to you this afternoon. It's always a pleasure to speak at CMSF on day one before any of the dinners start, and uh, it's one of my rules, don't speak on Wednesday, so if you ever get asked to speak, sorry Fiona, but don't speak on Wednesday. Um, I thought I'd just briefly in my first slide answer some of the questions that Greg has posed about uh, whether we are um, small or big businesses because it often um, comes across surveys that we have to fill in. We get sent surveys uh, with organisations that you know have thousands of employees and it's not applicable to our businesses that in many cases have, uh, have less than 100 employees. And so the perception out there is that we are big businesses, but when you look at the metrics, as Greg said, of numbers of staff or turnover, we're actually in the main small to medium-sized businesses. And there's differences, obviously, between those that have outsourced administration and investment management to those that do it in-house. So my perspective, obviously, will be from the, uh, the outsourced um, model. And so on the metrics for us, I have about just under 60 um, staff. So we are actually a small business with um, large assets. Um, one of the real differentiators, I think, that in answering Greg's uh, question that he's posed about as we grow and get bigger, whether we will lose sight of uh, what we're there for, and that's for the members, I think one of the strong benefits of the trustee, uh, representative trustee system is that that member focus will not be lost. And if we maintain that system, we might uh, have to make some changes around the edges to it, but the core of that system is what will keep members' needs as the focus of our funds as we continue to grow. Now, for anyone who was at the AIST uh, lunch late last year, you'll have seen these figures before, but I thought as an example I would just uh, 
show you how Hester has grown. When I came to Hester in 1998, um, you can see there 14 staff spread across the country, uh, certainly not in every state and territory, and 1.4 billion in um, assets. Today we have 14 billion, as I said, just under 60 staff, and we have offices in every state and territory except the ACT, which we service from New South Wales. And if you look forward, you know, that's just going to grow. We are a growing fund, we will continue to grow. We cover health and community services, one of the fastest growing sectors of the economy. And in, you know, the projections are within quite a few years, we will be the largest sector of the economy. So we are going to continue to grow. And, uh, and we'll be looking at a, a probably large increases in the number of staff um, over the, the, you know, the next 10 years or so. And staff growth, the areas that I think that it's going to be most in is education and advice for our members. This is clearly a growing service uh, that funds are embracing. We've been in this business for, uh, for quite a few years now and, uh, and we've uh, got an innovative model that works for us. And I think this is one area where we will um, have staff growth over the next few years. The other area is investments and governance, and whilst we maintain um, an outsourced model of investment management and we don't have a plan at the moment to increase markedly our investments and governance team, um, there will be some growth in it as there has been over the last three or four years. But one of the biggest areas I think that funds are going to have to look at is people management. Um, that is something that's also been outsourced. A lot of funds use recruitment agencies to, uh, to recruit staff. Um, but it might be something that needs a rethink. We've, uh, since I've been at Hester, have never used a recruitment agency to recruit one member of staff. Um, we do it all ourselves, uh, and it's an area that I think that um, is important for organisations. And the reason I think that it's important for organisations is that your biggest asset is your culture. And people should be able to work, walk into your offices, they should be able to deal with your staff in any state or territory and know that they are from Hester by what they do, how they act, just their being should represent the values and culture of our fund. And it's something that we spend a lot of time maintaining and one of those things is recruitment. And what people need to, I think, think about is that you, can, you can't recruit people and teach them those cultural values. People either have got it or they haven't generally. Sometimes, you know, that's not sort of universally, but in the main. So it's important to recruit people who actually fit your organisational culture because technical skills can be learnt. And if you employ someone who might not have the, the array of technical skills that you want, but have great potential and a fantastic cultural fit, then that is a real bonus for your organisation. I think that, um, I see that said on the slide there that the issue is um, attraction and not retention. If you have a staff member these days, and increasingly as we employ more Gen Ys, um, if you have someone for three years, that's good. That's what you should plan on, having someone in your organisation for three years. If you have them for five years, that's a bonus. And if you have them for longer, that is fantastic. And we have, Hester has a lot of long-term employees many of them long, much longer than five years, which is a fantastic um, thing for our organisation. But as we go further into the, the, the Gen Y generation, you need to have a mindset about not having employees for long periods of time. And so when they come into the organisation, what you need to get from them is creativity, flexibility and commitment. And if you get those three things out of employees for three years, then your organisation is going to be doing extremely well. I just put a list here of some of the things that I think people um, in this day and age, and if you read any human resource uh, manual at the moment, you'll see that this is what people are looking for when they come to work for organisations. So it's important as businesses that we actually look at this from our own perspective. And I'm going to use a few examples from Hester in addressing this slide. Obviously, organisations want to be employers of choice. And some ways of doing that is to get outside recognition for it. Hester last year was a finalist in the ACI BCA, Business Council of Australia, National Work and Family Awards, something we were very proud of. Um, some funds have um, EOWA recognition, uh, get it right, Equal Oppor Opportunity in the Workplace Awards, um, but not all organisations are actually eligible for those awards. You have to have a certain number of staff, I think more than 100, 
and uh, you also have to, or you have to be a reporting agency, which most funds aren't. People these days are also looking for organisations that have a corporate social responsibility policy, that do something in the broader world. At HESTER, our main um, corporate social responsibility aspect is the Mother's Day Classic run by women in super each year. Also, our staff have six days paid leave to go and volunteer um, with an organisation of their choice during the year. We've just introduced this policy and it, ha it hasn't been taken up universally yet and I've given them all a lecture about the fact that this year is the year when people should start looking at what they can do in the community outside. Environmental policy. A recent survey by one test showed that 73% of Gen Ys consider a company's carbon footprint to be important in their choice of employer. So you have to be able to demonstrate that you actually care about the environment and that you've got something in place in your organisation that goes some way to looking at your carbon footprint and how you're going to reduce it. Flexible working hours have been sort of on the board for some time when you talk about what uh, people are looking for, but sometimes they're not always uh, implemented in the way that, that people want. But access to part-time work, especially after maternity leave, recognition that employees have responsibilities outside work, adequate leave provisions, annual leave, family leave, leave without pay, ability for people to move around jobs and, and if possible to move into state if they need to, is all things that people value in organisations. Training and professional development that meets individual as well as organisational needs is also important. Leadership development, individual personal development, um, attendance at, at conferences such as these that increase people's technical skills are all important. And I think you also need to understand in this um, time of longer employment, the, the needs of different generations of workers. Um, at Hester, I've got people in their 20s to in their 60s and people want to work differently. They have different um, aspirations and they have different ways that they actually go about their work. And that has to be understood and recognised and accommodated. So in summing up, um, we, I think we'll need to employ initial or more human resource personnel, either as managers or part of a, an operational group of the fund to manage not only recruitment, but also employee engagement and development. Particularly important for us, um, as I said before, as we do not use um, recruiting agencies, and they'll all be on my door, I know, more than they are at the moment. Um, and there are a range of considerations that obviously come with growth but having the right people is the key to taking your organisation forward. Thank you. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Uh, David Atkin is uh, going to uh, go second. David uh, uh, recently joined CBUS from EWS Super, and before that he was the Chief Executive of uh, My Fund Just Super. Thank you, Greg. Uh, well, the first thing I want to say is I'm actually an imposter for this presentation. Um, I'm now the uh, CEO for CBUS, but actually what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, emergency services and state super, uh, EWS super, <coughs> as a case study to uh, bring out a number of the issues that um, uh, Anne-Marie has, has already outlined. And I would certainly say that um, uh, the way super funds manage their people and the kind of culture that we uh, want in our organisations is very important and um, don't happen by accident and so some thought needs to be given to it. Um, <coughs> I mean, we're the custodians of not-for-profit, industry, public sector funds. We represent our members' interests. And I think unless we are able to uh, consciously reinforce the kind of culture we want going forward, then we are prone to the sorts of things that Greg talked about in the future, which is that we'll be captured by the executives and uh, we'll turn into something else. But perhaps we can return to that uh, a little later. First, I'd also like to thank uh, Penny Snow, who's uh, the head of HR from EWS Super in helping me put this presentation together. So obviously there's been significant change in the super landscape, uh, and increasingly our strategic objectives will require us to look at, at the people and culture aspects of how we manage our businesses. Once upon a time, we could manage our people around the table, but as we've got larger and larger, that's become much more difficult. We've had to create extra levels of management uh, and uh, it's much harder then to ensure that uh, you've got the accountabilities there unless you put explicit processes in place. Um, we need to capture the discretionary goodwill of our workforce and unleash, unleash their energy and creativity and commitment to deliver our strategic objectives. That word discretionary 
I mean, at the end of the day, if you've got a good culture, that discretionary effort people will want to put in because um, it makes sense to them. Uh, you can't force people to do something that they're not happy doing. Uh, and another future challenge for not-for-profits will be to integrate our heritage while we grow as professional organisations. And it's important to note, I think, that culture is developed by accident uh, or, or by design and we need to be deliberate about building our culture. So let's just uh, look at um, uh, EWS Super as a, a, a bit of a case study and I'll give you some context here. EWS Super was uh, formed in uh, December 2005 as the Victorian Public Sector Fund made up of uh, two organisations, Emergency Services Super and the old government superannuation office. Combined, it has about 160,000 members and 17 uh, billion funds under management and over 130 staff. Uh, the, uh, this was a, f a fund that was uh, formed in fire. Uh, the sponsoring uh, participants were unhappy about the merger occurring, uh, but once it was agreed to, it was a very delicate process to put this organisation together and make sure that it had a culture that all the stakeholders were happy with. Looking at the two component parts, uh, it was they were both self-administered. Um, we had sort of 30 staff on the emergency service side, about four, four billion uh, funds under management, uh, an open uh, defined benefit scheme, one of the few left in the country, and accumulation. Uh, it was a very uh, multitasked uh, staff, uh, very connected to the emergency services culture. On the GSO side, it had been, uh, there was 100 staff there, uh, and very complex defined benefit schemes. Uh, there was a, a range of cl uh, closed defined benefit schemes. Uh, deep technical expertise. Um, a passive culture though, um, because the, it was a closed defined benefit scheme, uh, the staff were unable to talk to members about uh, uh, doing uh, you know, member education and um, taking up additional products because they were prevented from doing so. That has since changed, uh, but there was a very different, two very different dynamics between uh, the organisations. So how do, how do we approach the task of merging these two different cultures? A merger, the loss of, a, of the past, a new CEO, relocation. I mean, don't underestimate the impact on morale and commitment this could have. So it was important for us to find out how our people felt. At EWS Super, we conducted an employee uh, opinion survey conducted in early 2006, which provided us with great insights. We found staff were proud to work for us, um, doing their very best to serve our members, loyal and committed. But the findings alerted us to five areas for, for improvement, how we respected and valued everyone, how the executive team led the strategy and modelled the, the, the values, how we worked together across the organisational boundaries to get things done, how we recognise and reward people, and uh, the communication and consultation, how that was undertaken. So with these insights, it was critical uh, that we acted on what we identified. We deliberately set out to address these issues and uh, build the desired uh, member-focused culture, which was, act, uh, the, was the key for us. Our people plan took a multi-layered approach, which involved our vision and objectives, uh, looking at building the culture, looking at the way in which leadership was conducted in the organisation, the way we communicated, consulted and involved. And we also had some specific merger related tasks. We had to develop a new enterprise agreement that covered everyone. We needed to co-locate. And we had a whole range of policies and programs that we needed to uh, revise. So looking at uh, uh, sort of uh, people, uh, values, we, we needed to be clear about the values and behaviours of our fund, which included determining what we stood for, the way we worked together, how we would conduct our business. It was important that we took both an external as well as an internal view, so we aligned the values to members' expectations by using our member research. We flagged that values and behaviours were discussable. We wanted to have a discussion in our organisation that was, was to say, it's okay to talk about these things the way we worked together, what our expectations were. We ensure that all values were central to uh, our decisions and actions, and we let people know that they would be held accountable. It was important to call, uh, call it when, when you saw things that you weren't happy with. But also, we also needed to avoid tribalism. 
uh, to check for the us and them, given that we had come from two different uh, places. Now, I'm going to talk about values and behaviours a little bit because at the end of the day, that's what sits at the core of your culture. And the following are the four values developed by our People and Culture Committee, which were encouraging and supporting our people. Uh, we have a genuine interest and respect for our people. Serving our members and stakeholders, we build a fund our members and stakeholders, stakeholders can trust and be proud of. Acting with integrity at EWS Super, we are committed to acting with integrity that matches the trust placed in us by our members, stakeholders and staff, and shaping our future. As a forward-looking fund, we embrace, shape and celebrate the future. Now, I know every organisation goes through their vision thing and uh, their values thing. Clearly, the, 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 the test is how you actually integrate it into the way you operate. So to support these values, the committee also identified a number of behaviours that would illustrate the values in action. So, for example, a staff member demonstrating these values would share information, knowledge and skills with others, provide constructive feedback to others with tactful, tactful candour, seek to anticipate, understand and deliver on member and stakeholder expectations, identify the most appropriate solution for different member circumstances, consistently deliver on commitments made to others. Now, these are, those behaviours were quite tangible and uh, we, would, we, we ensured that uh, they would be reflected in the way in which we um, uh, develop people's individual per uh, performance plans. So moving another step further to embedding the culture. Workshops across the organisation from executives to frontline were conducted to build understanding of the values and behaviours. We ensured that the people plan was a key part of the overall organisation's strategic plan, not just an add-on. We incorporated into the performance planning and review process for each individual a 10 to 30% weighting on the values and behaviours, some of which I've just outlined. We structured discussion on values at team meetings, which became a regular agenda item. And the reward and recognition scheme introduced to acknowledge and award individual or teams for outstanding contributions. And we developed management capability to actively respond to behaviour that was not aligned to the values both formally and informally. Uh, develop great leadership clearly is, is, is key uh, for a way organisations are, are run for them to be strong and effective. So the way the leadership team models the values is essential. It creates respect, trust and cooperation. It was therefore important that we developed a highly effective leadership team which could draw on each other's strengths and experiences. This included both the executive team and the middle management. I want to emphasise the middle management because in some ways they're, they're the most critical plank in all of this. And the leadership development themes were focused on uh, leading the values, developing and championing the strategy, connecting everyone to the strategy, leading and integrating and a in a changing organisation, building a new climate for ideas and improvement. Now, every organisation that I've ever been involved in, internal communication is one of the biggest challenges, in particular in an environment where change is constant. And that's certainly the case in our industry. And we wanted to see change as business as usual rather than just uh, dealing with the next thing. So to do, to do this, um, we sought to create continual opportunities for involvement across our levels, to build communication and cooperation across organisational boundaries, and to connect all we do to the strategy. It is one of the hardest things to get right communication and it is worth the time and energy uh, spent on it. So we developed a, a, a multi-channeled approach uh, using CEO roadshows and intranet team meetings, cross-functional project teams, consultative committees, a multi-layered approach to get the communication happening. And in particular when you're having to deal with change, that, that operates across divisions. One of the complaints is the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing and people don't know what the overall st strategy of the organisation is or what their role is, uh, where they fit in. And so the communication process is critical to get that right. As we implemented the business strategies of the fund, uh, it was important that we kept in touch with our people, uh, how our people really felt. We needed to ensure that the executive team was accessible to staff. We wanted to discourage hierarchies. We used the People and Culture Committee to act as our ears and eyes, and the role of the HR team was very important to be close to people. But there's no point finding out what's going on if you aren't prepared to act on it. And you, you need to take real-time action, you need to respect the feedback that you get, and you need to deal with it in a combination of quick wins and longer-term actions. 
So how have we gone? Well, we, re we recently conducted a pulse survey midway between our next fully employed opinion uh, survey and we found that staff felt a connection to the future vision of the organisation. Had it, it had moved from 59% to 84%. Staff are satisfied with EWS Super as a place to work, 77% to 84%, but importantly we had an increase of 19% for strongly satisfied. And the executive team have a clear sense of purpose and direction from 47 to 70%. However, there is still some way to go to achieve the level of cross-functional communication and cooperation that we are aiming for. So that's the EWS Super uh, case study, and perhaps we can explore some of the issues raised there in further detail later on in question time. But Greg has asked me to uh, just touch on, uh, from a more ge general sense, how superannuation businesses are thinking about uh, what some of the issues uh, from an investment perspective. So I'll, just to, I'll quickly run through these, and again, we might explore these further. But clearly, we see at CBUS, switching hats now, our role uh, as manager of managers. Uh, superannuation funds have, have moved to become more professional fund managers, of managers, and that's an, an area of focus going forward. It's important that we get the investment government models, governance models right. Um, the way you make decisions and the way you spend your time can have an impact on returns. And uh, international studies are showing this is a very important area of focus for, for funds. We need to get the right mix of resourcing, internal versus external, and this obviously depends on the size of the fund and investment uh, philosophy. Uh, competition for resourcing has increased. I mean, as a fund, we're now competing with Future Fund, VFMC, fund managers, asset consultants. The actual, uh, uh, the challenge for talent is a, is, a, is a real one. And relationship with managers has changed. Access issues, relationship focus, more competition for the good managers and products, impact on fees, these are all issues. Uh, increased focus on risk and governance budgeting, increased risk measurements, stress testing, uh, which is the latest uh, sort of uh, discussion we've been having with APRA has, is, has become a theme. And current areas of our focus will be on return expectations and increased market volatility, ESG, and an after-tax focus. So, I will stop there and uh, we'll pass over to David, who's our next speaker. Thank you.